wants it. We need it. Must have the box. Sneaky little booktubers. Wicked tricksy fools. Um, um. Welcome to Book Time with Ryan. I am Ryan, and today I'm going to be talking about collecting books. I watched a video recently by Andrew's Wizardly Reads, and it talked about collecting books. And I think we would agree that collecting is a very personal process, a very unique approach to each collector, and what you collect can vary. Even in the book world, you may be collecting editions, you may be collecting authors, you may be collecting subject matter. There's just so many different things that you can collect. Some people are collecting first editions or signed books. I think we each approach it differently. I certainly did not start out with the idea of collecting books. I think I accumulated some really nice books without planning to do that. And more recently, I've made a concerted effort to locate certain books. And I'll explain how I do that. So, but before I do, there's my globe. I did an unboxing about this globe. This is a MOVA globe. And watch it spin. It's spinning during this video. It's powered by the light, ambient light. And it's run by a, a magnet. The globe is actually suspended in liquid within a, a second sphere. So, pretty cool. It should be spinning the entire time I do this. During this video, we are going to go on probably a few field trips. Where are we going on our field trip? We're going to go to the bookshelves behind me. Because some of the collections are just too big to take down individually and it would just be annoying so we'll go over there for some of it while it's not a tag i do want to thank andrew's wizardly reads for posting his ideas on collecting and inspiring me to do my own video let's get started books in my collection are books that i'm interested in i've said this before on some videos but i don't collect books just to have them on a bookshelf there are certainly books out there that would be really cool to have really old books from the 14, 15, or 1600s, 1700s. That thing would be neat, but am I interested in the subject matter? One, can I read them? If they're in Latin, no, I cannot read them. If they have long S's, I would try to read them. That'd be more difficult, but I'd like to like to try. I don't have anything that old. I think the oldest book I have up there is probably from 1885, and we'll look at that. I have generally read books when I've found books that I've read that I've really enjoyed, I've looked for better copies. Not all the time. Specific books. When I'm talking about collecting, there's we're going to go over some different collections. Some of these collections are more expensive. Some of these collections are just kind of loosely defined. But in general, with the exception of three books, which I'll tell you about, I have spent more on books after I've read them. So I've read a book really loved the book and then went out and found a better copy either a first edition or a signed copy or a signed first edition that has allowed me to collect books that i really appreciate books that i've enjoyed as a reader that has also prevented me from adding books that may be pricier or maybe rarer but don't really interest me there are four copies of books that i bought the more expensive version of first and then because I didn't want to damage them by handling them and reading them all over the place I bought a, a less rare less expensive version of the book first example of that is not an extreme but about one to two years I looked for a book called the secret and the secret is a book about a treasure hunt after looking for a while and not finding a book that I thought was appropriately priced I gave up. I thought, this is not going to happen. I'm not going to spend $1,500 on this book. I stopped looking. Well, one day I was in a secondhand used bookstore that is really based off of impulse buys. It's called McKay's Books. They don't really list their books. It's not something you can go online and search for copies that you're looking for. You just have to go in and just kind of get lucky. I went in and I, I don't even remember what I bought. It may have been like a comic book or something. And I was heading to the checkout and I saw a glass container that had some like, I don't know if it's like witchcraft, magic-y stuff, whatever. It's, it's not stuff I was interested in. But on the top shelf of that case, I saw The Secret. It was for 75 bucks and I couldn't pass it up. So I bought it. And that was a very, very, very good price for it. I went back later. It's first edition, first, first printing of The Secret, 
I went back later and asked them if they realized how much more expensive this was online. And they basically said that they can't price their books too high because it's really an impulse buy approach to selling. People aren't going into McKay's to spend $1,000 on a book. It has to be somebody who's going in, sees something, and then decides to buy it on a whim, which is what I did. I got that book, and the book is a treasure hunt, and it has clues both in paintings by John Jude Palancar and in verses, 12 locations within North America where keys were buried in boxes, and those keys will lead you to precious jewels. It's a real treasure hunt. They have copies now, which are white. The the uh, first edition, first printing are the black, black covers. But the new ones have a white border on them. They have all the same information, but the quality of the paintings is not as good. And the detail in those paintings is important for the, the treasure hunt. Out of the 12 treasures, I think three or four, I think three have been found since 1982. I believe. So that's one example of a book that I got a second version of because I wanted to preserve the first edition first printing. And there are people who have a Japanese version. There are a couple hardcover examples out there too, different bindings, but that's that's kind of an example. The first book that I spent a lot of money on was Codex Seraphinianus. Now you can get a more recent copy of Codex Seraphinianus for $100 or $150. But I wanted to get the first edition, first printing, which was printed in Italy and is in two volumes, just really well done. So I bought that. And then when I was concerned that I would be looking through this thing and tearing pages, I went out and got a cheaper version. When the 40th anniversary deluxe edition came out that signed, the first edition signed, but when the, the 40th anniversary of the Lux came out, I purchased that too. Maybe the ultimate example of buying the best version of something first and then collecting after that is White Collar Crime by Edwin H. Sutherland. I decided I was going to read this book because I had read a number of other books about White Collar Crime. And these books referenced Edwin Sutherland and his work, White Collar Crime. I went online. I went to eight books and I had to decide what version of this book I wanted. There were 35 years or so of the book's existence. It was censored. And then in 1983, an uncensored version of the book was released by Yale University Press. And I went on eight books, and I found a book that was an outlier in price by a lot. I went back and forth with the guy who was selling it. He had bought it at an estate sale, and it was a carbon copy typescript of the uncut or unexpurgated version of White Collar Crime. And I bought it. It came down to price. I bought it, had it uh, looked at and appraised, and it came back with a really great appraisal. So I had this version of it, but that wasn't going to be a version that I wanted to read. It's kind of delicate, and I didn't want to damage it. And I knew it was unique. I decided to go out and collect the other two. I got the censored version, and the censored version I got was from 1967. This was originally published in 1949, but I wanted a copy that was, was censored that was published after... The first copy I got existed, just to show that even though this thing existed, it wasn't available to the public for another 20-some years. And then I got the uncensored version from 1983 from Yale University Press. And I read both of them. I read the 1967 copy that was censored. After I finished that book, I read the uncut version, and the uncut version was better. I mean, it's not that different, but really adding the names of individuals and companies, which is how the censored one was censored. It, it, it removed those references and took out a, a chapter. The uncensored edition, having that information was, was much better. I mean, it was a com not a completely different book, but it was a harder hitting book with specifics, which I really enjoyed. Now that collection is not complete, right? I have technically I have three copies of that book, but what I'd really like to do is find the first edition from 1949, which is from Drayden Press. The 1967 copy is from a different publisher, but the first year, first couple of years were from Drayden Press. And Drayden Press is the, the publisher that kind of forced Edwin Sutherland to censor his work. The two copies that I had of White Collar Crime, this is from 1967. This is from 1983. I got this. These were both secondary purchases after I purchased 
this. And this is the really good copy. This is not what I bought though. I, I had this made. This is a clamshell box for uh, White Collar Crime. And this is what the, the book looks like, White Collar Crime. Um, the carbon copy typescript. So I had this box custom made for this book because it's so unique. And I had the colors done because of the school that the professor that wrote this, Edwin Sutherland, uh, worked for, Indiana University in Bloomington. And uh, there's a few nods. Italian leather, which is one of the first editions internationally, was available in Italy. And then the cloth is Japanese Asahi cloth, and that was the other version of the book was available in Japan. So little things like that, I think, were special for this book. So there's one other book that I bought the best version of, and that was 1001 Banjos of Samar Collection. I've done a video on the entire collection, but that first book was the best book out of his entire collection. There's really nothing that comes close. So that was the first I bought, and then I, in a collecting spirit, I decided to buy more and more of the works that he made that were about not only his banjo collection, but guitars and vinyl records and ukuleles. I have a video that has a very detailed look at that collection, and I'll include that in the description. I also get into books that I go into not knowing very much about, love the book, and then get a better version. That happened most recently with Jaws. I did an unboxing of Jaws, but I had read Jaws in modern paperback version. I loved it. That inspired me to go read Jaws 2 and Jaws the Revenge, which were both paperbacks. And then recently, because of the impact that Jaws had on my channel and the way I've, I've kind of approached reviewing books and covering books, I found a first edition, first printing of Jaws. I asked my wife for that for our anniversary gift, and I got that. There's an unboxing for that, which is really cool. Technically, it's not an unboxing because I went to the store and picked it up, but they could have sent it to me because it's an hour away. So they, they were going to mail it to me, and I just couldn't wait. So I went down and got it. Another example is, and this was probably the big surprise of this year, Moby Dick. I, I thought Moby Dick was going to be a really hard book to read. I originally got some kind of Penguin Classic edition that that's cloth-bound and has some nice... Um, silver highlighting or whatever on the front but I found out that that silver was coming off on my fingers so I took it back to Barnes & Noble and picked up a different copy the copy that I picked up I, I tested it a little bit it was hardy um, the, the pages were sewn in so it was going to stay together it had its own silk ribbon bookmark and the pages were kind of glossy it was a nice a nice copy uh, but it was probably uh, 20 bucks I read the book I loved it I had a graphic novel version of the book I'd already read, which I enjoyed, but really reading the full book was was amazing. And from there I decided this is such a great book. It is a it's an American classic. It's the American classic. It's so accurate with the way it depicts whaling and the way it goes into the anatomy of whales and the behavior of whales that I wanted something better. I, I still kept that copy. But I went out and I got the 1930 Random House and Trade Edition of the book that is illustrated by Rockwell Kemp. And it was a, a, it's a pricey book. But I bought it. It was a great, great condition, I think. It's fine and near fine, but it's, it's a, I like it. I think it looks great. The dust jacket is amazing on it. With some collections, you don't just get one or two, right? It's a collection. So with Moby Dick... I had three books at this point. I had the book that I read. I had the really nice version from 1930. I had the graphic novel version. And my mom, on the same day that I bought the uh, the expensive Random House copy from 1930, she bought me uh, a copy from 1940-something, maybe 1941 or 46 or something like that. So that's on my bookshelf behind the tooth um, over here. It's I think it's right there. And then I found out through reading another book about the sinking of the whale ship Essex by Nathaniel Philbrick, he references a copy of Moby Dick that's very academic, has some pretty extensive extra material from Northwestern University. My wife got that for me. That was She got me two books for our anniversary, Jaws, and this really nice copy of, very thorough copy of Moby Dick. 
and that's this this teal one here that's an example of i think when you expand your collection you may have various editions that you like either because of the way they look or the information they contain but you may expand it just so you can experience some of that other material if i had just my 1930s moby dick copy um, I wouldn't have access to all this other information that came in this later edition of Moby Dick. This is the Moby Dick that I read in its entirety. I got that, and then I decided to get a very special copy, which is over here. This is the um, Random House from 1930 that is signed, or not, I'm sorry, it's not signed, that is illustrated by Rockwell Kent. This is a, a good copy. So, um, I got that, and on the same day that I purchased that, my mom bought this for me. This is another uh, copy from World's Greatest Literature, and I bought this one. This is the really thick one that has thousands of pages, and it's about it has some other additional material besides just the the basic Moby Dick story. It also has some of his annotations that he that he wrote in a copy of Owen Chase's The Wreck of the Whale Ship Essex, which is a book that I've talked about on, on this channel. Uh, you also see that there's a copy of Sounding, and this is the less special version of Sounding because I got a limited edition signed copy, which I really love. This is actually the copy that I read, and I liked it so much and wanted to share it with other people that um, I got this copy so I could, and I wouldn't risk losing my my good copy now there's a copy of a book that really means a lot to me my wife is from uruguay and when i started to research uruguay i found a, a national geographic magazine that had information about Uruguay called the purple land and it turns out the purple land is the name of a work by a guy named william h hudson who was born in argentina to english parents but he grew up in argentina he eventually moved to England. Or his parents may have been American or something. They spoke English, but he also spoke Spanish. So he wrote a book in 1885 called The Purple Land That England Lost. And it was a commercial failure. And it was done in two volumes, but it was such a failure that they eventually collected the two volumes and they combined them into one volume in, I think, 1887 or 1889. And it was a failure until 1904. And in 1904... It was released as The Purple Land instead of The Purple Land that England lost. A chapter was removed. There were some <clears throat> inaccuracies, I think, corrected in the first text of the work of fiction. but uh, And then it was re-released to commercial success. And if you've read Ernest Hemingway's The Sun Also Rises, there's a reference to The Purple Land in that book, which is from the 20s or 30s. Borges says is the greatest gaucho story ever told. I wanted to go out and get The Purple Land. I read The Purple Land. I thought it was amazing. It was so readable, so understandable, especially for its age. And I loved it. I discovered that there was this other version of it, this rare version that was very expensive. It came in two volumes from 1885. There was a copy that was signed. And the general area that I lived in was pricey. So I actually got that for either my birthday or Christmas. But that was after having all these other versions of it purchased. And then I had what is, I think, the greatest the greatest edition of it, the original first edition, first printing of The Purple Land, The England Lost. And this was the first copy of The Purple Land. I think this is one that's printed when you order it, was a print order, whatever it's called. This is the copy that I read by the pool one summer. It was great. I would drink mate and read The Purple Land. This is the, the two slim volumes, volume one in volume two of the purple land that england lost from 1885 these are hard to find they are pricey they are beautiful and they're signed and then i had this cheap copy and those expensive copies and i was like eh, you know why stop there i found a 1904 copy and i bought it it was cheap not in great condition but was the same as this has the same message in the front and then I found, I was at a bluegrass festival in upstate New York called Gray Fox. And I went to a local antique store and I actually found a copy of The Purple Land. And this copy has illustrations, which is pretty cool. So I bought that and that was cheap. 
the, the fact that they even had copies it has the characters in here uh, illustrations of the characters I just I, I thought it was really cool so I bought that and then the final book that I bought related to this was the small copy the purple land and these are copies these are the armed services editions these were sent to service members during World War II so they had something to read it's the full book but it's small even on the cover of this thing, that is the illustration from the book I just showed you. So uh, it, it was just kind of a collection that happened without really planning. There are also collections within collections. I started reading John le Carre right before Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy came out in the in movie theaters. And the first book that I read was Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy is part of a trilogy called The Chronicles of Carla or Quest for Carla. And it involves a character, a Russian character named Carla, and it involves the hero of a number of John le Carre books, George Smiley. It's a great book. So I got Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, read it, loved it. And my girlfriend at the time got me the omnibus that had the two other books. Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy was the first of the trilogy and then came The Honorable Schoolboy, and then came Smiley's People. I read the other two books, The Honorable Schoolboy and Smiley's People, in that omnibus book. The omnibus book is up there behind this little Coast Guard plate. So I read it. I loved it. That got me into all the other John le Carre stuff, and I've read everything that he's written, and it's all up there. It's, well, everything, every, every book that he's written, it's all up here, and it goes all the way over to here, and there's a biography about John le Carre. This is all the books that I have of John le Carre with four exceptions which I'll show you and what you'll see here is they're based off of the author right so they're not the edition. I've lost editions somebody I think stole one that was yellow that looked like this. There's a, a book club version of his first book so I, I actually pulled that out of a free bin and replaced it with the one that I had that was nothing special but I don't have I'm not consistent I'm not consistent in the editions that I have here and I don't I don't know what to think about that. Like, I, I, I like what I read. I don't see a reason to go out and buy all the same thing because there's so many books. There's just there's too many to do that. Up here you'll see Ted Bell. I also have all of his books. I did because there were less books at the time. Switch out some of the paper backs that I had for the the hard hardbacks. But uh, I guess an exception to that is I never got rid of. Oh, it's still behind it. I never got rid of the first book that I ever bought of his. Pirate. Pirate signed. It's the first book I ever got at Ted Bell's and it's special to me. Also, you'll see that I have more than one version of Phantom. Here's the paperback. There's the hardback. And then I also have a copy of uh, The Ark or The Proof. And this one's signed by Ted Bell and uh, he wrote a special note to me. I'm a character in this. I'm a fictional character in, in Phantom. So it was, it was special to get that. I tried to find an omnibus that had the dust jacket or had the other version of it because one version of the Chronicles of Carla or Quest for Carla, one's from the UK, one's from the US. In looking for a copy of that book, the other edition, the other version of that book, I got in touch with... Uh, book company that focuses on mysteries and spy thrillers and they're out of santa fe new mexico and i was in santa fe at the time they looked for that book they couldn't find it but they said hey we have this older version of tinker taylor soldier spy would you like that and i said how much 20 bucks i said sure that's great but it was on a truck coming from san francisco to santa fe and i was leaving santa fe within the week so it probably wasn't gonna get there in time they said that they would forward it to my address in Virginia, and that's what they did. And when I when it arrived, I found out that this wasn't just an old version of Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. This was the first edition, first printing of the UK edition of Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, which was awesome. Uh, much more valuable than $20. Through some work, some digging, I found out who John le Carre's agent was and who his representatives were. I got in touch with them. I asked them if I mailed them this copy of the book, would he be able to sign it? And he was able to sign it. It actually took a couple months because it got lost a little bit. It was left in the post office in London 
and they had not realized that it had been delivered or had arrived and they were just waiting for somebody to come pick it up from his agency. So he signed it. It came back. Now I had this first edition, first printing of Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy signed by John Le Carre. Now the three books in the trilogy, my favorite is probably Smiley's People, but Tinker Tailor's right behind it. I mean, it's a classic. The movie was great. The Alec Guinness version of it is even more more accurate. I think uh, just a great, great film. So at some point I visited an antique store near my house and I found a first edition, first printing of Smiley's People that was signed. I think the price was maybe 120 something, 130, maybe 150 tops. I didn't buy it because I wasn't really into spending on books at that point. But it was like, okay, that's that's cool. That's there. Well, I was going by this store like a few years later, probably, and I found out they were closing. I think it was a lease issue. They were losing the lease. It was kind of like a hoarding situation, maybe, and it was kind of like a fire sale. And I went into the owner who I talked to last time. I said, hey, um, you had a copy of Smiley's People that was signed. I don't remember the price, but you still have that. And it was at his house. So he's like, I need to go check. It's not here. And I said, well, if you have it, I'd love to buy it. And I was like, I think the price was whatever. And he said, sure, I'll, I'll check. So he called me back and he said, I have the book. You said you would pay this amount. And I was like, sure. He's like, well, I'll give it to you for, and it was like $10 less than I had agreed to pay, which was pretty much the opposite of what I expect negotiating for a book. Uh, so I got it. He brought it from his house. I went into his business, purchased it. Even though I had all the John Le Carre books, I had within that collection, almost like a sub-collection, of two out of the three Carla, Quest for Carla trilogy books. I had, and they were both signed, and they were both first edition, first printings of the UK edition of the book. Amazing, right? And I probably paid 170 bucks for both of them. Total. I was missing The Honorable Schoolboy. And I'm still missing the honorable school boy because within the next couple of years John Le Carre died and all the prices for his book shot up especially first editions first printings and especially signed books because that was never going to happen again so I've seen copies on like a books for thousands of dollars to have all three and the problem is I don't want to get all three I already have two one of them it's even more personal because I'm I'm the one that sent it to get signed. So I, I'm keeping my eye out to complete that collection to find a first edition, first printing of the signed The Honorable Schoolboy from the UK. It's going to be something I just have to have patience on. So that's a collection within a collection. And these are the two special copies of the, the trilogy. Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. Smiley's People. Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy is the one that I sent away. And I had this little letter with it, with the compliments of John Le Carre, and it was signed. Very cool. You've seen my John Le Carre shirt, same kind of signature. Smiley's People uh, has a slightly different signature. And I was a little concerned about that. It's also in blue. It's a little different than Tinker Tailor. And I was a little worried about that, but I looked online and that is, there are basically two, two forms of his signature and they're both legit. So, and, and both of these signatures are the forms that he had. So it was fine. You also have collections that are based off of subject matter. I've done some videos on whales, but I really got into whales after reading a book called Sounding by Hank Searles that was initially kicked off by going through all of the Jaws books. I started buying books that were about whales, but not just any old whale. I was looking for books about sperm whales. So I have a collection of books that are about sperm whales or, or whales and the behavior of whales and the evolution of whales, especially sperm whales. So I have that too. So there's a lot of travel books and stuff here, but this is also where I keep a lot of my whaling stuff. Secrets of the Whales. This is actually about uh, Scrimshaw. And then there's a sperm whale book 
and another sperm whale book, and another sperm whale book. Well, this is about other whales too, but it's another sperm whale book. And then this is also about some sperm whale studies. So um, this is kind of an example of just sub collections. There's books in here about travel. There's books in here about whales. There's books in here about Uruguay. It's the last kind of collection that I can think of, I mean, I'm, I'm leaving out all my comics. They're obviously, if you're getting comics, especially when they turn into trades or, or the hardbacks, you're getting, you're, you're trying to get them in order because there's a, a longer story there that, that's over a period of, you know, maybe five or 10 books, either in comic form or when they're condensed into trades or hardbacks. I'm leaving that out. So the other thing that I've collected is I went to the U.S. Coast Guard Academy and I graduated in 2006. Now the Coast Guard Academy has moved around a few times. It was created in 1876 on a, a cutter called the Dobbin. And it was located on the Dobbin for a while, and then it made its way to Curtis Bay, Maryland, which is where the Coast Guard Yard is now, where they repair ships. And it was the campus was there for a while, and it moved from Curtis Bay, Maryland, to Fort Trumbull in New London, Connecticut, which is an old, I think it was an old Civil War or Revolutionary War fort. The classes, the, the buildings were within the fort. Pretty cool. It's an old looking fort. It's still there. You can take a tour of it. It's actually right next to a Coast Guard station. Coast Guard Station, New London, Connecticut. In 1933, and this may have been part of the New Deal, I'm not 100% sure, maybe part of the, the works process to get people in jobs, uh, a campus was built. And it was built in New London. This is the, the permanent campus where it is now, where I went. There were less buildings at the time, but... It was built in 33 and 34, and I don't know if it was completed in 33 or completed in 34, but I wanted to read about some of these old locations because it just as a graduate there, there's a lot of traditions. It's not a fun place to go to school, but it's a valuable place to go to school, and it's a good place to graduate from. It's had changes over the years, but it's been surprisingly consistent in some ways, too. It's moved a number of times when it was a very small institution but now, you know, it's in its permanent location. It's been there for almost 100 years. I have four yearbooks from when I was a cadet. But I started looking for yearbooks from earlier years. And I worked in the Coast Guard Public Affairs Office. And part of our office was also the historian's office. And I had access to older yearbooks. The yearbooks are called Tide Rips. So I had access to older yearbooks from the 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s. And every so often during lunch or whatever, I'd go down to the historian's office and I'd just check them out. They're pretty cool. There's also a lot of them at the, the academy, too, which I didn't know at the time. So I eventually found copies online, and I found two copies from 1908, and that's before it was called the Coast Guard. It was actually called the School of Instruction of the Revenue Cutter Service. Same seal, different words, same seal. And it's amazing to look at that. That's when it was off of the Dobbin, but it was at the the location in Curtis Bay it had just been there for not not very long. And shortly after that was taken, it was going to move to New London, to Fort Trumbull. So I had these two copies. I actually thought one of them was from 1906 because that's how it was advertised. And when it came, it was the same one. So I have two of the same copies of Tide Rip. One was Rebound. Which, well, I'll show you that. And then the other one is, is a little rougher, in rougher shape, but it's hasn't been touched. I got those and then I started thinking, well, what about these other copies? Like I have this one that was from Curtis Bay, Maryland. There's also Fort Trumbull. So can I find a copy of Tide Rips that covers, has photographs and stories from their time at Fort Trumbull? And um, obviously I know what happens once we move to our current location in New London. But um, are there any yearbooks that have kind of the process of that that show some of the building process uh, i got some of those i looked for 1920s copies and i found uh maybe 29 or 28 the earliest i've seen of in the 20s is 1925 but i didn't that wasn't mine that was part of the, the historian's office so i started buying some of these older yearbooks pre-world war ii just to see what that looked like and then there's certainly there's a yearbook for every year Right. So I haven't done that. I got the yearbooks that I thought would be interesting to see the development of the school through the years. And I'm 99% sure that the first um, Tide Rips edition came out in 1905. So the fact that I have, a 19, I have two 1908 copies means there's really not much further I can go back. But there's certainly a lot of time in between 1905 and 2022 that 
you could look for. I'm just not interested in finding books that are, are more recent. This is the last copy I got. It's from 2006. This is the copy from my senior year. There's our class crest. How cool is that? Oh. And they've certainly gotten bigger over the years, but I'll just show you my picture real fast and then we'll continue on to look at some other copies. There's mine. That's where I went. My first ship was the U.S. Coast Guard Cutter Vigorous. I was a government major and I grew up in Nashville, Tennessee. I told you that I like to see different progressions of the Academy. So one of the other copies I have is from 1933. These are get smaller. Um, certainly more manageable when you're holding it up to a camera. This is when it, the current location where I went uh, was being built. And the neat thing about this copy was it came with Albert Everest Harnand. His picture, I don't know if this, what kind of picture this is. Yeah, he looks pretty young there. Um, but there were also pictures of France, obviously Paris. And I don't know who these guys are, if these are shipmates or what. So that came with the book. In the 33 book, there's some pretty interesting pictures about the construction of, this is Satterley, or no, this is uh, Chase Hall. I guess it's the, the construction of a number of buildings. And uh, that's just kind of cool. Oh, here's a picture of Obji, uh, one of the mascots, the bear. So you had that kind of unique look at how the Academy was shaping up, which for somebody who went there is just really neat to see because we inherited that. Uh, we inherited that, that building and that campus 70 some years later. But there are older copies. I, I told you had some from the 20s. I only have one actually from the 20s. So that was 33 and that's when it was at its current location in New London, Connecticut. I think that may have been the first year that it, it moved there because Tide Rips from 1932 has pictures of the old location. Actually, here's Bravo Company. And that's at Fort Trumbull, Fort Trumbull, which is cool. I was in Bravo Company. Um, it's a very interesting look. We didn't look that different seven years later. This has some illustrations of the old location. So I think it was must have been kind of the final, the final look at Fort Trumbull before they moved. Now, in 1929, they were in Fort Trumbull. I mean, that was their location. There wasn't, it wasn't that they were preparing to move. So there's some really cool pictures. This is 1929 one of Fort Trumbull and the cannon or artillery and just how they lived life there. It's, it's still there. I mean, the Fort Trumbull is still in existence. So you can go there and check out what the place looked like. Look, I mean, here's some sports teams. This is the basketball team, football team. So that's 29. And that was at Fort Trumbull. Now, before Fort Trumbull, the Coast Guard Academy was located in Curtis Bay, Maryland. So this is the rebound copy of Tide Rips from 1908. The interesting thing, one of the interesting things in this is that it has a seal and it's really the same seal that we have today, but this has the old name, School of Instruction Revenue Cutter Service, United States Revenue Cutter Service. That's before it became known as the Coast Guard. And this has some really interesting pictures, some different stories, has some very old looking ships, ships that were in service at this time. Uh, it just, for me, it was very cool to be part of the legacy of this, this service when you could see cadets from 100, 120 years ago and what it was like then. It was all male at that point. When I went, it was mixed, mixed gender. Here's a baseball team, the Revenue Cutter Service School of Instruction. They had cooler uniforms then. I'll show you an example of a uniform. Probably not as comfortable, but yeah. This is the Revenue Cutter School of Instruction, the Coast Guard Academy. And you think about when they are serving, they're serving right before World War One, 
and the Coast Guard had the highest percentage of casualties in World War I for the U.S. military. Here's a life-saving drill. That's what they were doing. So it's kind of my part of my collection from the U.S. Coast Guard Academy and, and Coast Guard, which I've tried to collect a number of years, and I have from 1908 through the mid-1930s, and then four tide rips from when I was a cadet, from 2003 to 2006. It makes me excited to be an alum of an institution that's had the impact that it's had and, and, and has the history and eventually earning a class ring that means a lot because it wasn't easy. It was certainly not fun. I've explained to you kind of my my approach to collecting. I, I collect, some of them are based off of the author, like John Le Carre or Ted Bell. Within that, there are some special smaller collections of books, like the Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy and the Smiley's People editions that are from 1974 and 1980 that are signed in first editions, first printings. I also have collections of books focused on a specific topic, like whales or sperm whales or whaling. Things like the Coast Guard, Coast Guard Academy. I have an entire bookcase about business, economics, and finance books. That's a separate kind of collection, although it's so big that I'm not sure if it counts. And really, a lot of that collection is based off of references from other books that open my eyes to books that I haven't read yet. And then I purchase those books and read those. Some of those books are almost like sub-collections within the business, economics, and finance books that are about 2008 financial crisis or Enron or banking failure. I think for me, the, the takeaway after I've even thought about these collections are that a lot of them are just organically happen. I don't, I don't set out looking for a collection. I'm not like, I want to get all these books and collect all this thing. I find a book that I enjoy. I find a book that I think is interesting. I read it. And then I want something even more special than the copy I had. Just almost like a trophy, some kind of memento to the book that I enjoyed. And that's what happens. I've gotten pretty lucky with a number of these books. I have spent a lot on some of these books too, but I've also, I think, gotten pretty good deals on a number of them that I didn't realize how lucky I was until later. And you can collect anything you want or nothing. You don't have to collect anything. But if you are going to collect stuff, collect something you're interested in. Collect the edition that you like. Collect the author. Collect the publisher if it's some kind of neat publisher, different collections that publishers are putting out. You'll kind of see that with like Easton Press or Franklin Library or Heritage Press. So you have so many options. There are even like almost like sub collections within collections that you can do where it's a special character that you like, a special illustrator, uh, and a special edition. And then you can even go into the that kind of the, the offshoots of your trade press, which is, you know, the, the special limited editions limited signing, whatever kind of is out there, you have a lot of options. Or or you don't have to do any of that. Just read what you like and then keep it or give it away. It doesn't really matter. But for me, I have collected things that I, I loved as subject matter and that I wanted to have a piece of history or a piece of... I wanted something more, something special. And that's kind of where a lot of my collection has been built upon. I hope you enjoyed this i'd love to hear if you collect anything especially book related what that is what your approach to collecting is um, because i think there are just after watching andrews on andrews wizardly reads there's so many different forms of collecting and it's not like we're all just gonna meet and say this is what a collection is and this is what applies and doesn't apply it's really what you want it to be so do what you want and and let us see it maybe make a video and, and show us how you collect how you how some of your collections have formed and what your process is or what you look for, um, what your, some of your treasures are, whatever it is. It's, I think it's really fun to, to look into it that way. So thanks a lot. I'll see you later.